um, and uh, begin a transition uh, uh, into uh, a different topic for next Sunday. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you've given us the time here on earth to, to reflect your light, to um, be willing participants in your invitation to, um, to work in the lives of those who would come to know you, Lord. Uh, we pray for those hearts uh, in our community to be quickened by the Holy Spirit, uh, that they will be sensitive to um, your message, Lord, to your gospel that was shared once and for all. Uh, we thank you for the provision of your son, Jesus Christ, um, his sacrifice, perfect sacrifice, his resurrection, Lord, and we thank you that he's interceding on behalf of us right there at this very moment. Forgive us when we miss the mark according to your will, according to your word, Lord. Bring us back into quick um, reconciliation and, and, um, and relationship with you uh, to bring us back into that right relationship through the confession of sin because you promised that you are faithful and just. Forgive us the sin. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We started off the book of Jude by uh, actually uh, referencing uh, William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Maybe you probably have forgotten that because I don't know when we started Jude, but it seems like months and months ago. Uh, but um, uh, we talked about Polonius's famous uh, statement uh, that brevity is the essence of wit, and um, and certainly Jude chock full, chock full of incredibly important uh, doctrinal concepts that he is able to accomplish in one book in 25 verses. It is amazing uh, what the Holy Spirit did through, through Jude uh, with really a singular mission, okay, but an incredible organization of, of, uh, of, of words, of, of, of logos. I mean, he, he even gives us a salutation, he gives us a doxology. He gives us an assertion or a contention. He makes an argument. He const fully constructs an argument um, with all of the relevant um, uh, elements of persuasion. I mean, we see in here logos, the logical argument. We see pathos, an emotional appeal. Um, in terms of the use of th you know phrases like hidden reefs and your love feasts and 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 fear and whatnot, uh, as well as ethos, which is uh, uh, the 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 authority. He speaks of the Holy Spirit guiding him to 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 write this, even though his intentions were were different. He gives us the prophecy of Enoch in here. He very much mirrors the language of Peter and the other apostles. Okay. Uh, he calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ um, and a brother of James. So all elements of persuasion and argument are resident in this very short book of the Bible. Um, he supports every contention, and he often supports every contention in triads. In a 25 verses, so many triads here. As my mother would say, he is an expert in the use of the queen's comma. Okay? There is a tremendous amount of information here. He previews a call to action. Do we remember what the call to action is? What are we to do? Contend earnestly for the faith given once for all. That's what we He previews that, and then he comes back to it at the end and gives us the recipe for doing it in a seven-part step, four of which are introspection, are personal, and three of which involve our relationships with others. It is an amazing, amazing book, and his examples span both the Jewish people, the Gentile people, and even angelic majesties. Okay, It is an incredible book, but it is so brief. And this week I was interested... <laughs> Actually, it wasn't just this week. It was just Friday. I received a, an email from, uh, from my company that I, I found more than ironic. Um, and here, here's, the, here's the gist of it. And I probably should tell Blake, turn the, turn the uh, uh, video off, but I won't. I, I can summarize this fine. We're in preparation for a national meeting that comes up early next year. And I get this, get this email. 
As we all prepare for our national meeting, one objective is crystal clear that we must accomplish, communication skills. Which, by the way, is a good thing to do, you know, when you're in a, in a sales organization, okay? Um, more specifically, however, the communication skill of getting to the point. I'd like your feedback on this. My mind just immediately goes, first of all, here's what my mind says is, don't take that bait. They don't want my feedback. It's a trap, okay? And you know it's a trap because you read further down in the email. This is not some pilot circumstance. This is a pet project because it says there will be a series of four one-hour Zoom sessions scheduled for January capped off with a two-hour interactive workshop at the February meeting. So I responded. Six hours of training on getting to the point. <laughs> no thank you. I need to get my resume uh, worked up. But uh, Jude gets right to the point. Gets right to the point, but chocks it full of so many great things. And today, we're going to summarize, attempt to summarize that which is already summarized. Um, and to be completely transparent with you, I had not planned on doing this this week. Okay, um, I had planned on transitioning uh, to um, uh, uh, a topical uh, lesson uh, revolving around the goings-on uh, in the Middle East. I've been approached multiple times by multiple folks. John has sent me a, a wonderful video uh, that uh, uh, his son, um, who is a pastor in Arizona, right? Or Ca California, yeah. Um, uh, you know, preached on this circumstance. And I know it's weighing heavily on a lot of people's minds. People have approached me. People have approached the pastor. So we will handle that next week. Uh, but the pastor wanted an opportunity to at least announce that that's what we will do next week in this hour. And so I've been preparing uh, some, some notes for that. So I really actually was not uh, thinking that we would summarize Jude. So if you want to get your number two pencils out, uh, this will be the final exam uh, in June. I'm just kidding. Let's summarize this, cause, and I'm going to go to a couple of different scriptures uh, as well today to, um, uh, to draw Jude to a close. So in summary... We start with this. We, as Christians, have status. We have status. Jude tells us what our status is. We are called, we are beloved in God the Father, and we are kept. Kept for Jesus Christ. What an outstanding promise. You know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've been called. You are beloved by God the Father, and you are kept. And ain't nothing taking you out. Nothing. It says that being led by the Holy Spirit means to follow his direction, not our own direction. You remember what Jude says? He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing in a different direction. That's being led by the Holy Spirit. Was Jude's motivation pure to write about common salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. What a wonderful message. I would have loved to have heard what Jude has to say about the common salvation here. But the Holy Spirit led him to provide this warning. This warning to the Christian community on apostasy. Now, something that is not explicitly stated in the book of Jude, but I think we can take away from it, is you should test Scripture with Scripture. You should test Scripture with Scripture. There are some people who take very small pockets of Jude out, isolated, and attempt to make some uh, conclusions from them or develop a theology out of them. But we are to test Scripture with Scripture. Okay? And we have done that often in this study. I mean, we have seen uh, parallel passages in Second Peter, because that is a, 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 a parallel passage of Scripture, but we have seen every author of the New Testament 
Uh, when we have looked into this, we have, been, we have seen uh, things out of Daniel. We have things, seen things out of Zechariah. We have seen things out of Isaiah. We have seen things out of Jeremiah. We have seen things out of Leviticus. We have seen things out of Exodus. We have seen things out of Numbers and Genesis. Okay? And he points us in this direction. All these examples that Jude brings in, even from the Old Testament, which again goes to the point that all Scripture is, is inspired and it's all profitable. So he doesn't actually explicitly make that point, but it is a point. Another point that he doesn't explicitly make, but we made it early, is that just familiarity with Jesus is insufficient to save. That is insufficient to save. Jude and James lived with Jesus. They were his half-brothers. They knew about him. I don't know if they played backyard football or shirts and skins basketball or whatever was going on in those days, but they knew him. They lived with him. But John, 7, John chapter 7, 3, 3, 3 through 5 says, they did not know him as their Savior. They did not know him as their Savior until later in their lives. Jude and James had to be saved just like everybody else on this planet that's ever lived comes to salvation. And they did. They did come to know him as his, their Savior, and we will meet them in eternity. It's going to be ironic if we meet Jude and we find that he is gregarious and verbose. I'm not expecting that. But it could be, because he could have written this, you know, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he could be the most verbose, gregarious person that's ever lived, and the Holy Spirit would have, would have directed him as to what to write and how to write it. There's a lot of things today who, that bring people close to the truth, up beside it, inside of it, okay, but they leaven it, or they leave something out. Admiring Jesus is not enough. You hear this all the time. Oh, I think Jesus is a great man. That's a great man right there. Okay? It's not enough. Being born into a Christian family is not enough. Do you think Mary? Do you think Mary knew who Jesus was? We're about to get into the Advent season, okay? okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll probably look at that at some point. You better believe Mary knew. Mary knew, but it says his brothers did not, not at least at that time. Declaring status as a Christian because you think you need to identify with some religion is not enough for salvation. See, we live in a, we live in a culture of identity politics. You probably have heard that, okay? And I, I think it's pretty well self-apparent, okay? And I tend to agree. Identity is critically important, but we reverse it. It's not who we identify with. It's the extent to which, and it's all or nothing, God identifies us as righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. So yeah, it's God's perspective of identity that matters. And then I'm going to leave this on this topic on familiarity with Jesus is insufficient to save. It's never too late to not only come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but to engage in kingdom work. Never too late until it's too late. Okay? Until it's too late. We don't know when Jude, you know, came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we know this, he and his brother gave us some awesome, awesome words in the Bible. Now that's the positive. What was his warning? His warning was a, about apostasy, apostasia, which we defined as a defiance of an established system or authority, a rebellion, an abandonment, or breach of faith. And he says... Not only is it coming to a church near you, a congregation near you, it's already arrived. And he personifies these as 
the people who creep in unnoticed. Remember the creepers slipping into the water and not even creating a ripple? Okay, and they do a few things. They turn grace into licentiousness. In other words, grace into liberty to sin, and they deny Jesus Christ. Okay, and they are subtle, okay, but they are treacherous. And they are coming to a congregation near you. Jude does not tell us to fear them. He doesn't tell us to live in fear of them. He says they're here, and they were there. And what we know of, of human history and prophetic history, it's only going to increase. It's not about a matter of fear. It's a matter of discernment and contention for the faith. Now, you only warn, something, warn about something when there's a clear and there's a present danger. So these folks bring a clear and present danger into the Christian community. There's a danger to non-believers, the seekers, if you will. There's a danger that they would be led astray okay, by somebody perverting the faith, the key tenets of the faith. They're a danger to our Christian walk, okay? to our experience of the joy that God wishes to give us and being centered in God's will. They are beyond misguided people, according to Jude. They have been singled out, and we'll see this in a moment as well as one of the key points. They have been singled out for eternal damnation. They, are, they come with malevolent intent, and they are sneaky. They are sneaky. They are sneaky in their arrival, and they are sneaky with the way they present their false teachings. They slip into the pool without creating a ripple. They dine among us, okay? And we are to discern them and discern their teaching and know error from truth. And that's the next thing he tells us. We've got to know apostasy and apostates when you see it and you hear it. And we have to discern it and our response is to contend for the faith. So then the question becomes, how? How do we do this? First off, we've got to be anchored in the Word of God. We've got to be anchored in the Word of God. Studying it and applying it to our lives, letting the Holy Spirit quicken it within us, so that by studying the truth, you know what the counterfeit is. Okay? And so you might say, well, Greg, is this really a problem? Is this really a problem? And I don't often do this, but I have done it before. And, and one of the reasons I don't often do this is because I know how surveys are designed. I did psychometric surveying uh, for uh, a little while. And I know you can get responses from people uh, on agenda-based surveying. But when, a, when, when surveys match with Scripture... And when surveys match with our own eyes and ears, I think they're instructive. So a survey that was uh, conducted by the Cultural Research Center in 2022, I believe in the summer of 2022, using a 1,000 study uh, uh, responders, this is what they found. Studying a 1,000 Christians, identified as Christians, self-identifying as Christians. 39% contend that there is no absolute moral truth and that each individual must determine their own truth. 39%. 38% maintain, only 38% maintain that human life is sacred. And listen to this one. 37% say that having faith matters more than what faith you have. Three out of every ten do not believe that their salvation is based on having confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Well, I would say right there you could take that a thousand and shave off 30%. Because if you don't believe that, okay, you've got a, a substantial problem. Again, a thousand Christians. One-third or more believe... Determining moral truth is up to each individual. The Holy Spirit is not a living entity, but is merely a symbol of God's power, presence, or purity. That reincarnation is a real possibility. That having faith matters more than in which faith you, you have. 
the whole Ted Lasso believe and believe type circumstance. They all, uh, a third or more believe that a person is generally good or does enough good things for others they can earn their place in heaven. One third or more do not believe that people are born into sin and can only be saved from its consequences by Jesus Christ. They pers- and they, uh, one third or more also do not believe that they personally will experience eternal salvation solely because they have personally confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay? And I told you that this was a study of a thousand Christians. It's true. I did not mislead you there. But I didn't tell you the whole story. This was a survey of a thousand Christian pastors. There were some conclusions drawn from this, 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 uh, this study, which I think is interesting. Um, while studying the spiritual behavior patterns of pastors, it became evident that a large share of them do not have regular spiritual routines. There was a correlation between possessing biblical beliefs and a consistent regimen of Bible reading, prayer, worship, and confession. See that? There's a correlation between possessing biblical beliefs and a consistent regimen of Bible reading, prayer, worship, and confession. Now, when Tori and I were in high school in the 1980s, there was a phrase that our teachers hated, and my mother hated it more than anybody else. It was this one. No, duh. I mean, should be self-apparent that a discipline of Bible study, prayer, worship, and confession would lead to a fidelity of biblical beliefs. Study continued. In some of the denominational groupings, a majority of pastors do not engage in those foundational spiritual practices on a regular basis. Yet among the pastors who have the most consistently biblical beliefs, there's also a daily routine that incorporates all of those disciplines. Now, I could make a lot of application here, but one thing that we need, I think, to take away is we need to pray for our pastor. We need to pray for all pastors, not just our pastor, all pastors. Okay? We also need to evaluate their workload so that they can devote themselves to Bible study and prayer and preparation. It goes on. One-third of all pastors surveyed do not read the Bible during a typical week. Didn't say a day. A week. A week. And I like this analogy. (laughs) Debbie, you'll like this too. That might be compared to a doctor not washing his hands before the operation he performs during the week. It's unthinkable. It is unimaginable. We we know that 37% of pastors have a biblical worldview. (laughs) 37% have a biblical worldview, and that the dominant worldview among pastors now is syncretism, and that's the amalgamation of all faiths into one faith, one attempted faith. You might hear this phrase as interfaith, okay? But 37% have fidelity to biblical beliefs. Because pastors teach what they they believe, many churches are becoming centers of syncretism and secular thought. Perhaps without even realizing it, thousands of pastors have become leaders of a movement away from God and towards narcissism. With so many churches and their pastors in the culture's grip, rather than fervently committed to serving God and teaching his word, that would be contending for the faith, by the way, you can clearly see why most church-going Christians are being more influenced by the culture than the culture is being influenced by America's Christians. To see America culture transformed, he concluded, will require a time of Christians and pastors devoted to repentance and the Scriptures unlike anything that we have seen in more than a century. I will contend that he's wrong there, that the study author is wrong. I think... For us to get to that point, we're going to have to see a a return to repentance and the Scripture more than we have ever seen, not just in a century. But do I fear that? No. Why? The Bible prophesies this. It says, in the end times, there will be apostasy. There will be apostasy. 
have another study. I won't deal with this one, but it's what evangelicals believe. Now, this does go to people who self-describe themselves as evangelical Christians. Won't get into the details of it. We don't have time to deal with that because we are talking more about apostates and apostasy that's being led into our Christian community. But this study shows the impact of that. Because if you thought those numbers were stunning at the pastoral level, you should hear the study of those that are the parishioners or the congregants. So it's real. It is present. Jude was correct. All the apostles were correct in their writings. We live in a time of apostasy. So now I told you I was going to hit a couple of verses uh, to, to amplify uh, this uh, that are outside Jude. And if you want to turn there, it's great. Um, one, of, one of the, the scriptures, um, I've, always, uh, I've always associated this with uh, children's and youth ministry. Okay, and you, you'll, realize, you'll realize why. 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 14 through 18. Um, I always called it the Awana passage. Okay, it's the Awana passage, where it says, starting in verse 14, remind them of these things. Does that parallel anything you heard Jude say? <laughs> Does it? It's right there. Remember, remind, okay? And solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of hearers. In other words, don't get caught up in trivialities. Okay? You contend for the bedrock faith. Verse 15. Some of your translations, if you want to write, say study. Any, anybody's translation say study? None say study? Okay, so you're, you're probably using similar translation to me. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. There's your Awana verse. Your Awana uh, uh, verse. And boy, I tell you, we have got to get back to teaching our youth and our children the word of God. That's why we should be praying for people like Marzell, people like Emily, people like Naomi, everybody working with, with, with these, these children. Verse 16, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. You remember how often Jude talked about ungodliness? Over and over and over again. And their talk will spread like gangrene, like cancerous gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. You say, well, the resurrection has already taken place. But yes, Jesus' resurrection has taken place. But these people were saying that all of our resurrections have already taken place. That is false. That is heresy. That is apostasy. So even in the context of the Awana verse, you see that there's a warning against false teaching. So he tells us, Paul tells Timothy, remind, remember, be diligent. The Greek word there is spadazo, means earnestness. You get that? How are we to contend for the faith? Earnestly. And it's two parts, actually. Earnestness of purpose, which is your state of mind, which is your mission, and earnestness of effort, which means that it is active. It is activity. It should manifest in action. To give maximum effort, to exert, to spare no effort, to do your best best, to be diligent. To present means to stand. Hey, what did Jude tell us in his doxology that God will be able to do? To make us stand in his presence. Okay, So be diligent to present, to place, to stand. It implies an approval in God's eyes, an approval that is only, the only way that happens is through faith in Jesus Christ. It also means to have been tested to have been refined and approved for a purpose. And in this case, the purpose is service, okay? To have been refined, to be put through the fire, if you will, approved for the purpose. If you want to look at the opposite of this, by way of example, you can look at Isaiah 122, where it says, your silver has become dross. Dross is the opposite here, okay? That's waste. That is uselessness. 
It has been found worthless. Our worth is 100% in Jesus Christ. It says that we are to accurately handle the word of truth. The phrase here means straight cutting. Okay? It, do, it doesn't mean taking diversions. Okay? Straight cutting to build a straight road because the word of truth is a straight road and it all points to Jesus Christ. It is the same word that is used in Proverbs 3, 6, where it says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. If we want our path straight, we are in the Holy Spirit and in the word, applying it to our lives. Paul, who wrote these words to Timothy, he was a tent maker. Okay? In those days, you made tents by cutting out all these hides and, and stitching them together. If you didn't make straight cuts, if you didn't make stitching uh, straight, you had a leaky tent. There is no leaky tent in the gospel. This takes precision. It takes effort. It takes exertion. It is not lax. It is not uh, good enough is good enough. It is not lazy. Okay? It is effort to accurately handle the word of truth. The word of truth there, the word word, is the, is the word that we, you know, we know very well, logos. It's not only the visible word, okay, like if you, you, you see a seven-character uh, word, and you, like you know, I'm looking at the word waiting right now. Well, it has nothing to do with what font that's in or what size uh, uh, it, it's in or anything like that, okay. It's about the meaning behind it. It's about the meaning behind it, okay. It's not only the name of the object that you're dealing with, but the expression of thought behind that word. Okay? So the word of truth. Truth is God. God is truth. That's both the most sim simplistic way of saying it and the most complex. Because God is truth. Truth is God. There is no room for error anywhere. There is no room for leaven. There's no room for any impurity even though some of these pastors think that small amount of sin can be overcome by good works. That was in the study. Truth is God. God is truth. Apart from God, there is no truth. The definition of truth, the sum total of truth, the absolute truth, all that is true is that which conforms to God. Only that which is true is what conforms to God. It's completely reliable. It is completely immutable. It isn't going to change on us, thankfully. We don't contemporary, contemporize stuff. It is completely dependable. Jesus himself makes the claim, I am the way, the truth. Not a truth, the truth. And instead... What do the imposters give us? Flattering words, arrogant words. They are as clouds without rain, empty promises that leads to ungodliness, and it spreads like gangrene. It spreads like gangrene. We saw uh, 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 Paul write about uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Um, Hymenaeus, by the way, means singing man. Okay, Philetus, you know, P-H-I-L, you probably get, means friendly man or loving man, okay? And they, Hymenaeus and, and, and Alexander, a fellow by the name of Alexander, we know from previous writings, were apostates in the church at Ephesus, okay? And Paul excommunicated them, got them out of that congregation, but apparently Hymenaeus uh, was, was not content of that and come back and was continuing to try to mislead the congregants at the church at Ephesus, that, I think, is another takeaway lesson here, is that apostasy is relentless. It is relentless. The second piece of scripture I'll give you comes from the cha uh, Acts chapter 17. If you want to turn there, it's great. It's Acts chapter 17. It's a verse that many of us would be familiar with, starting in verse 10. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They'd been in Thessalonica. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. That's what Paul did. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily. We got pastors who don't get in the scripture in a week. 
And these congregants were examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, Jews and Greeks alike, receiving the gospel, coming to a saving realization of Jesus Christ. A few points here. It says they had an eagerness of mind. That means they were leaning in. They were loving it. They needed more. They desired more. Okay? And they were leaning, they were expecting that the Holy Spirit would 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 would, would, would lead them in the right direction. Confident that the word, okay, would be profitable and useful for reproof and all of its other power. It says they were doing it daily. It does not say they were skimming. Anybody taking a speed reading course? I've taken a speed reading course. You did it if you, if, if, if you were like my parents and they sent you away to like eight Saturdays of SAT preparation. You learned how to speed read, right? Get the first sentence, the last sentence. Does it make sense in the context? Move on. Don't read it all. This ain't the SAT. This isn't a test. Jesus already, Jesus already completed the test. Perfection. They're not skimming. They were doing an investigation. An investigation in the Scripture. But have you noticed this? I think I missed this a lot of times. What were they examining? Okay? What were they testing? What were they testing? Were they testing the Word? They were testing Paul's words to see if it conformed to the standard here. They were discerning through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were testing. They knew the answer key. Okay? In the Presbyterian Church larger catechism, we find these words. I think it's Catechism 157, I don't know. The Holy Scriptures are to be read with a high and reverent esteem of them, with a firm persuasion that they are the very Word of God, and that He only can enable us to understand them with desire to know, eagerness to know, believe and obey the will of God revealed in them with diligence and attention to the matter and scope of them with meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. Be in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. It is impossible for the apostate to bear any fruit at all of everlasting import. They're devoid of the Spirit. Jude tells us this. Their lives will betray them. They will be turned over to the lust of their flesh. And they will experience eternal condemnation in outer darkness and eternal fire. They are the grumblers, the murmurers, the schism creators, and the mockers who are antagonistic to both the sovereignty of God, his word, and his will. They are the blasphemers. Their ancestry, if they did a DNA analysis, their ancestry, Jude tells us, is the way of Cain. It is the error of Balaam, and it is the perishing of Korah in the Korah Rebellion. Ancestry.com of the apostates. It'd be right there. Don't even need to take blood. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have Jesus Christ, who tells us that Jesus Christ is the way, Jesus Christ is the truth, and Jesus Christ is the life. And then finally, it gives us the, Jude gives us the call to action. This isn't finally, it's I guess next to finally. To contend earnestly for the faith, he tells us how to do this. It's not something passive, it is active. It says build, build up in the faith. Be in the word, be spiritually guided. Be continually sanctified, daily renewing your mind. Pray in the spirit. Keep yourself in the center of fellowship with God. Confess sin when it enters your life. He's faithful and just to forgive us the sin. 
and keep our eyes fixed on things above, expecting the return of our Savior. In other words, keep our mind on heavenly things, not on geopolitical things, even though we're to observe them. Okay? Our mind, our focus, our desire, our expectation, our assurance, our hope is in Jesus Christ. And he's coming again. Those were the four things that he tells us that we are to do individually. The three things that he tells us to do in our relationships for those who are, have become in some way, shape, or form ensnared in the, the falsehoods of the, the apostates. Have mercy on those who are doubting. That's your at-risk population. Okay? Have mercy on them. Okay? Be a light unto them. Okay? Give them no reason to stumble further. Okay? They're the honest seekers. Okay? They may not be as well equipped with the word of God. Have mercy on them. Pray for them. Be active in kingdom building when you're called up. Do your part by reflecting the light of Jesus Christ so that others can see. Those that have started to move down the path of error. Rescue the perishing. Remember that? Okay? Be there for them. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Okay? And then have mercy with those who are so far down that path of false belief that their life is characterized, characterized, their whole identity is characterized by sin. They're embedded in sin. And be very cautious that you aren't led astray, that you are not infected by the perniciousness of sin because it is corrosive. It is corrosive. I remember, I, 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 I recall the, the uh, example that Jude gives us of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember those, those, those men with awful, sinful intent, struck blind, sightless, and yet they are still bent on committing sin. Still says, have mercy. Pray in the Spirit for them, okay? But be very, very cautious. And finally, this is the final, final. We saw the doxology, right? Always give glory to God. It's all His. It's all His. He's the one who has called you. He is the one who loves you. And you are being kept for Jesus Christ. Small little story here to, 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 to end. We talked about remembering. When you're omniscient, by the way, like God is, okay, and nobody else is, okay, remembering, conjuring up memory is a divine characteristic, okay? Ask the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit to help you know how to study, Okay? to help you bring to recall the principles that you learn in Scripture, okay? It's not something we just use, you know, pneumatic devices are wonderful. Songs are wonderful in this regard. Pray for the Holy Spirit to help you in times of stress and trouble to bring back, to recall these words. I had an opportunity to to sell for a brief amount of time in the um, uh, dementia space, okay? And it hurts. And maybe some folks here are struggling uh, with that in their, in their family, okay? It really hurts. But boy, I tell you, God doesn't forget you. He doesn't forget you, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you don't forget. We thank you that you've called us. We thank you that we are kept for you. We thank you that you love us. We thank that you love, thankful, we're thankful that you love the world. Help us to be a part of the kingdom building here on earth while there is still time. We thank you for the prophetic words of Scripture that we know what's happening, that we're prepared for what's happening, Lord. 
Forgive us where we fail you. Bring us back into a right relationship with you through the power of the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins so that we might confess and throw ourselves on, on your mercy to be the forgiving God that you are, Lord. We thank you for this, this service that will follow. We stand on your promise that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you will be also. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.